I'm here at the Cranberry Station. Of the University of, of Massachusetts. Of the University of Massachusetts. Yeah. And, and I'm here with Ann Averill, mm -hmm. who is a bee scientist. Will you fill us in a little bit about what the what is the Cranberry Station about? Well, the Cranberry Station is an interesting satellite of UMass Amherst. We are responsible only for Cranberry, and we work, we're right in the heart of the 15,000 acres of cranberry growing, um, the cranberry growing world here of Massachusetts, producing a third of the cranberries that are dispersed all around the world. If you talk to some of the growers, you'll find what they think is that they feel very comfortable here because they've been coming to the cranberry station for over a hundred years. The major thrust of work is looking at um, bumblebee and other native bee health. And so what we've been monitoring is the different parasites and pathogens in these um, bumblebees and to a lesser extent to other native bees. Because we've changed the pesticide regimes in cranberry in the past couple years mm -hmm. and we've moved to compounds that are supposed to be completely bee safe and the growers have moved extremely rapidly um, to adopt these bee safe compounds, I'm thinking that it, it is possible that the smallest bees were hardest hit by the broad spectrum insecticides mm. that we were using. And when those are completely pulled out, we may see quite an upsurge of, this, of the very, very small bees that, um, that could pollinate cranberry. We find them in small numbers, and we're gonna be monitoring this over the next five years to see if there's a change as, we go, as we're going bee safe in our, um, our cranberry bogs. The other thing that we have going on is trying to figure out what the um, pollen diet looks like in terms of, of pesticides. And so we've been collecting pollen from both honeybees and bumblebees, and we send that pollen to our cooperator at the Connecticut Ag Experiment Station, Dr. Brian Eitzer, and he's able to determine what the bee diet is, you know, what, what, um, what's in that, um, that pollen that the bees are, are, are feeding on. And we're finding that a lot of compounds are moving into the pollen. Even if you, if you use a herbicide in the spring, mm -hmm. shockingly, we find that in the pollen two months later. You know, that, it's a, that's a very, very big surprise. And we don't use any neonicotinoids. The big hubbub in the bee world is these, this new group of systemic insecticides. But what we've done is very carefully move neonicotinoids out of cranberry so that we, we have a limited use in August when the bees are off the bog um, for a real intractable problem of, of soil insects. But the bees are not getting neonicotinoids. What they're getting is what are supposedly these new bee safe compounds. But it turns out that even if you're spraying before and after bloom with various pesticides, it's not necessarily going to be 100%. Um, you know, the bees aren't necessarily going to miss it. So it is, we are finding very, very surprising results on that front. Laura's band, and it's all we had. So, right. but it was you had to be so careful because of uh, worker safety as well as environmental issues. And we actually lost Parathion because of worker safety issues in California, which is fine. I mean, they've been replaced with materials that are far better, yeah. and they they've been developed, um, not developed by the state bog, but they do all the efficacy work for the for the chemical companies and uh, prove our need. The materials we use, we have such good options uh, during fruit worm to use materials that are non-toxic to bees, which is great. He's got this boom here, so and you're using four or five ounces an acre, and and it's non-toxic to bees, so That's great. we're able to uh, stay away from the first generation chemicals. We don't have them anymore anyway, 
Yeah. But, uh, you know. Well, I'm, gra- I'm glad you understand that. It's, it's kind of a win-win. You protect the pollinators, and then they pollinate better for you. We learned quite quickly that you, if you use dorthane, um, you want to do it in early June and then stop because ah. it's a systemic. Scientists always argue with me that there was no effect on the bees, but when you lay in a bog mm-hmm. and you look for an hour and you don't see a bee doing full bloom, something's happening. Yeah, that sounds you know? kind of hokey. Kind of common sense. But anyway, we don't, we don't, I don't know if we still have that material legal to use. We don't use it anyway. It's, it's a, we have these wonderful tools that Marty and Ann have, have gotten uh, cleared for us. The Cranberry Institute has a chart they put out every year, and every material we use is rated uh, for bee toxicity and a few other things. So you, you stay away from the materials. The ones that are real toxic? Yeah, and we don't generally use them here anyway. You know all about neonicotinoids. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't use that. But the, you know, we use a material called Intrepid, which is mm. a very specific to cranberry fruitworm. Um, that's the one at, at full bloom that's, a, that's used, and it's, we've never had an issue that we know of. Well, that's good. Yeah, and it works. I mean, that's, and it's safe. What we're talking about is enhancing our native bees to have this, this baseline of, of bees that's out there to, to help out, essentially, to enhance what we're seeing. And growers are very excited that I've had so many calls this year. I'm seeing more bumblebees. And I think it's a result of our change in sprays because you need to know about honeybees, you need to know about bumblebees, and you need to know about we have another 70 species of native bees that, that we find out on the bog and around the bog. Wow. But there are about 15 that are important. 20 years ago, we had eight species of bumblebees. Hmm. And that's pretty much what's been here for a long time. And um, along with the rest of the Northeast, two species have disappeared, Bombus affinis and Bombus tericola. And there's, they've simply, it was like, poof, they're gone. Um, whereas they made up 10% of our collections, um, both of them, each one was, was um, represented 10% over a span of only three or four years, suddenly they were gone. And what we're seeing is a single species, Bombus impatiens, is filling in that gap. So that we have, when we go out and make a collection, seven of 10 bumblebees may be Bombus impatiens. We recognize that we want a community of pollinators out there on the cranberry bogs. We're not, we're, we're focusing on, on Bombus because we have a lot of, a lot of people that are looking at, at um, honeybees. But for us, our main native pollinator is um, in the about five species of bumblebees. Five different species of mm-hmm. bombus. Mm-hmm. And the, the bogs should be abuzz with them right now. Well, we, <laughs> we saw this here at, at, at your bog. It's mm-hmm. right outside mm-hmm. the door yeah. that the population of bumblebees is very healthy. Yes, it is. It's, bumblebees are having a good year. Isn't that great? Well, that's great. Mm-hmm. It's going to be great for for everybody Mm -hmm. that has anything to do with cranberry.